What is good? What is good? Welcome to Dub Nation, your hub for everything Utah Warriors of Major League Rugby. I am Jerem Jordan alongside Banks, a guy who is almost as athletic as the new Warriors mascot, Koa the Panther. Look, don't be mad just because you don't have supreme athletic ability like Koa and I do. Anybody that's never played in the front row doesn't know what an apex athlete looks like. And here it is, baby. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Koa's Co legit, man. Uh, he was uh, doing his thing at uh, the second home game Saturday. Uh, We'll discuss that game, of course. We are live on the Utah Warriors Facebook and Twitter accounts on demand on kslsports.com, the KSL Sports app, the KSL TV app. Rebroadcast Thursday nights, of course, on ESPN 700 and 960. We love our broadcast partners. They are the best. Give us a like, share the show, follow the Utah Warriors on social media. If you have a comment, fire away. We'll try and get some of those to you. And we are handing out some swag per the norm. All you have to do is make sure you uh, like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and more, and then share the show, the Dub Nation show, across to your friends on Facebook or retweet the post of the game on Twitter for your chance to win a signed game ball. Spread the love. Share the gospel that is rugby here in Utah, and uh, let's add more members to Dub Nation. As Rage Against the Machine once said, now testify. Okay, here's what's <laughs> on the rundown. We'll recap what happened in a close loss to Seattle. Ah. Came down the uh, came down to the wire. Some controversy. We'll talk about it. Check out scores and standings from around the league. Preview the roadie at San Diego. Although it's not actually in San Diego, we'll talk about that. We'll chat with fullback Cliven Lopeser. Gosh, he had an amazing try on Saturday. And today's rugby 101 discusses penalty kicks. But let's get right to it. Twenty to fifteen, the Utah Warriors lose to the Seattle SeaWolves. This was a bit of a surprise, Banksy. Seattle came in with the fewest points in the league. Utah came into the match with the most points in the league, yet uh, the Warriors come out with a close 20-15 to 15 loss in this one at home. There's lots of different reasons and whys that we could give for what happened on the field at Zions Bank Stadium, but at the end of the day, you have to execute and play the game that's in front of you, and the Warriors end up on the losing end of that uh, against a very determined Seattle team. They brought a lot of beef with them. They knew they had to match the physicality of the Warriors and brought a lot of big bodies with them. And, uh, and we saw them stick to that game plan throughout the entire match. So both sides had guys missing. It's, uh, you know, round four of the uh, tournament here, the contest, the competition. Sama Malolo, Aston Fortine, Michael Basket, Tyler Fisher out with some injuries. Seattle didn't have Ben Seema, the fly half, and kicker. Uh, Brad Tucker, Sh Shalom, uh, Suniula as well. So it was, uh, you know, both teams weren't at 100%. But uh, Utah was plagued by errors. Many were unforced. Uh, like uh, the week before at New England. In the last 10 minutes, notably, a line out inside 10 meters that was knocked on in a mall. And then on the other side of the field, uh, inside of 10 meters, uh, you know, with five minutes to go, a turnover. And so there were certainly opportunities for Utah to win this game and late. And unfortunately, the Warriors didn't take advantage. It could have started off with a quick five points, even right off the initial kickoff. Uh, if you remember, the game started in the fourth second with this big start from Hagen Schulte, the ball's mistaken by, I think it was Reichard Hatting, who got a little tap on the backside from Josh Whippy as he was going over, dropped the ball, and two was able to pick it up and run down the sideline, but the referee calling contact with the player in the air for a little cheeky tap on the backside and bringing the ball back for Seattle. So you kind of had the feeling right there that the, uh, the whistle wasn't going to go our way that day. And it was tough at the end because it seemed like the Warriors and and the gorilla the gorilla squad coming off the bench, the, the forwards uh, were pretty dominant in in the scrum and the mall. And Seattle, to their credit, that's what they had to do. They kept pulling down the mall illegally. Eric Duchel gets a yellow later. It happens multiple times throughout the game and twice late. A penalty try could have been given to the Utah Warriors, and that would have been an automatic seven, and probably would have meant the win. Derek Summers opted not to. The Warriors were pretty upset. And then there's no extra time. I thought it was officiated uh, interestingly, perhaps poorly at the end from our point of view with the Utah Warriors, of course. I thought a penalty try could have been given. It wasn't. A yellow was given. Duchel left. but And he kind of saluted. He's in the Air Force. But I can't. I think the salute was like, we just got away with one. He absolutely knew what he was doing. Eric's a friend of mine. <laughs> and I talked to them after the game, and challenging them all was 100% part 
part of their game plan. It's why they brought the forward pack that they did here, and they knew they were going to have to stop that mall if they were going to win this game. And it started in the first half, and actually an early yellow card given against Seattle uh, for pulling down the mall. And then they continue to do it eight or nine different times before being penalized again with any kind of significance. So I don't blame them for continuing to go to that game plan because they were getting away with it. Is it necessarily kosher rugby? No, but the inconsistency of the refereeing allowed them to continue to follow that game plan. Now, if the whistle had gone in the second half, the way it did in the first half with those penalties, we may have seen a completely different outcome, but I think it's in the referees heads now that they are making calls that are impacting the final outcomes of games. So now they're trying not to, and in trying not to, they're affecting the final outcomes of games by just not calling the game that's in front of them. You know, the game happens at such incredible speed. And when you're down there in the thick of things, it's incredibly tough for these referees to make the right calls. We saw several times plays away from the ball, uh, the, the referee in the wrong position to make some calls. You know, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt on the, on the field, but call it consistently. And it's the inconsistency now that I'm seeing start to really get frustrating from these referees and the officiating. And you see it in all of the MLR games. It's not just for the Utah Warriors. Yeah, and it was tough because we thought, okay, last couple of mi minutes here, and uh, Duchelle goes off. There's like a minute left. There's a line out for the Warriors inside of five meters. This is going to happen. The Warriors are going to win this game. They're going to go get a try, and then Hagen Schultz is going to have a chance to win this. But no, uh, you know, there's a turnover from the Warriors. And then all of a sudden, there's no extra time, like literally 10 seconds, which I thought was a little weird, but you, you move on, right? For, um, as, for as much stoppage time as there was with the uh, with the injury in the first half, I mean, we had almost 15 to 20 minutes of just no play going on. There were several other instances with down players with cramps in the second half. I thought at least two or three minutes would have been warranted, but I mean, at 80 minutes and 30 seconds... The referee was like, nope, we're out of here. I don't want to have to deal with this anymore. Did Derek Summers have dinner plans? Because last year, this game went to the 90th minute. So I don't want to hear that there's no extra time. <laughs> Although well, Seattle, and with, Seattle with that had much continued and applied pressure, you have to let the game develop within that margin of error. That's why it exists in the rules. And I, I understand that the referees don't want to put themselves in a position to have to decide the game. But I believe in these circumstances – he missed the call. He absolutely made the wrong call and just wanted to get off the field because he didn't want to have to deal with it. I mean, we're talking a line out on the five meter line. Goff throws it in, makes a miscue and the ball goes the wrong way, but the pressure and the, the momentum still the Warriors way. And three minutes is a lot of rugby to have to kill the clock for Seattle. So, yeah. So it, it again, a uh, bonus point loss. That is if you lose within seven or fewer, you still get a point. So, Back-to-back -back weeks with at least a point, which is better than nothing. Um, but other things that that uh, you know were interesting in this game, Seattle could have won this more handily. Um, it, you know, if Utah plays the same way, because there were three kicks off the post. It was two conversions and a penalty kick from Kieran Joyce. One off the post is like, ah, you see that every couple games. Two, pretty rare. Three, I I'd never seen that. That was that was crazy. It's tough. You know, he was. It's to be that on target and still be off target has to be frustrating for a kicker. But the only way, it's like a pitcher that's in a slump. The only way to get out of it is to keep throwing the ball. You know, you just got to keep taking those kicks. And it's, I mean, that's the toughest job in all of rugby. You're the only man doing anything on the field. All eyes are on you and points are at stake. You got to make those kicks. And thankfully, we've got some weapons on the Warriors side of the ball, who, by the way, I don't think really ever got any opportunities to put the ball at Hagen Schulte's foot or Cliven Lobster's foot. You know, that didn't go our way at all at any point in this contest. Yeah, and that's two weeks in a row where Hagen Schulte is not getting penalty kick opportunities very much. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, you are you're you want to put those awesome forwards to the test with, uh, with scrums at points. But I wonder if that's more of an option, um, you know, for Utah moving forward, if it's a possibility. Because Hagen Schulte is one of the best in the league right now. Um, seven conversions. He scored 29 points through four. That's top five in MLR. He's certainly uh, he's certainly a weapon, um, and then you look at the some of the stats as we break down this Utah Seattle game. Fifty three percent possession for Utah, uh, you know, forty seven percent territory. A couple of tries for each team is kind of lower scoring. 
74% gain line made, uh, 78 for Seattle. Tackles, uh, you know, 105 for Utah, 88 for Seattle. Scrums, 90% of the scrums won by Utah. That was a little bit of a difference. And then lineup, Seattle was only 73%, and Utah was 89%. I thought neither team really executed those uh, very well on this one. Matt Jensen was a force to be reckoned with in the air. And really the miscues came in and you've got to give him a little credit. Chad Goff hasn't played any kind of rugby in almost a year and a half and then comes in in a tight contest and has to this on three of them. One really low that was stolen by Seattle. One that goes over the top that was cleaned up but puts the Warriors in an awkward position. And then, of course, the final one that was a miscue and stolen uh, on the five meter line driving in in the 80th minute. So tough situation to have to go into, but you're the hooker. That's your job. We're professionals. You've got to make those throws. You've got to execute the fundamentals perfectly to win in this league. And regardless of what we think about the Warriors and the way we're treated by the referees or the inconsistencies, it all comes down to you have to execute your game. And yeah. The Warriors didn't. Too many mistakes. A knock on a meter out and this game goes a different way. We're talking about a quick tap from Lance Williams that he knocks on that doesn't go, you know, to his hands, and and now it's a turnover. You know, there's lots of little moments there where we absolutely had our destiny in our control and couldn't get out of our own way, and it's the second week in a row that that's happened. So I expect some big accountability from uh, Coach Pittman on what these guys are doing and how to make better decisions in these key moments. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the good news is it feels like a lot of this is controllable. Um, I felt like Seattle won the game, but Utah very well could have won this game with a few uh, moments here or there. Honestly, it's one play away, right? Uh, it's one uh, one play from from winning this thing. I was really impressed by Joe Mono off the bench. He had some really nice line breaks. Mika Cruze was good with the ball in hand. Mikey Teo did his thing. Cliven Lobster had one of the tries of the year. His step and go was incredible. We'll talk to him coming up in about 10 minutes, so hang with us. So there were some real bright spots in this one for the norm. I think they're still figuring out in this back line exactly where the pieces fit. I wouldn't mind seeing some other things move around and some other guys get the start. I think Joe Mano, every time he gets in the game, is the kind of guy that can be electric. He, he almost scored what may have been the try of the year had he been able to pick it up. We're play, getting an advantage played to us, and – Hagen sees Joe on the outside, puts the boot to it. Joe goes up on the sideline, takes it with one hand, tap dances down the left side of the, the uh, touchline and is able to score it. And the touch referee saying he went into uh, the out-of-bound zone and that gets called back. That could have been the try of the year, but for millimeters of chalk going down that touchline. Yeah, that was, that was exciting. And you're right, Joe is a flashy, awesome player. Um, and, and he, he nearly had it, I think is, no, this isn't the one, this is one of his good uh, runs, but yeah. Uh, Tuvede Vungakoto on the MLR team of the week. Congratulations to him. Uh, not often, uh, does a player from the losing team make the MLR team of the week. So nice job by, uh, the Fijian there. So, uh, you know, uh, a five point loss and, uh, San Diego coming up next. We'll preview that one coming up. And, uh, the crowd was great by the way. Um, I, I think high 2000s, low 3000s. Uh, I think low 3000s was the final number by the time it was all said and done. Amazing. A lot of those guys were in the stadium uh, for the curtain raiser with uh, the University of Utah in-house playing the curtain raiser and stayed all the way through. It was a great atmosphere. Dub Nation showed up and they were ready, along with Koa the Panther, our mascot, to cheer on these Warriors. Unfortunate not to come away and be rewarded with that win. If you want to join us, April 24th at Zions Bank Stadium. The Warriors host the Houston Sabercats. It's our next home game. Get your tickets at warriorsrugby.com. This is going to be a really, really, really tough game with the Sabercats gaining some momentum and the Warriors needing to add points to stay at the top of the table. This is a tough Houston Sabercats team coming to town. We need Dub Nation to show up and get loud. So get your tickets at warriorsrugby.com. Yeah, I can't wait for that one. We'll talk about what Houston did, which was special after the last two weeks. Coming up in a moment as we look at the week four Major League Rugby scores. Let's start with the top team in the league right now. L.A. Giltinis, the Ostinis, as uh, we like to call them. A 43-16 win against Toronto. This was in New Orleans. Toronto not playing at home. Giltinis doing their thing. They've scored 40-plus in all three games. Six tries from six different players. Five points in all three matches. They've been perfect. My question is, will anyone challenge them this season, Banksy? You you can, 
And the, the game plan actually in beating LA plays into the Warriors' strengths. Just like a lot of Australian teams, we saw Manu Samoa do it to Australia a couple of different times. You basically just have to hit them in the mouth uh, and keep hitting them in the mouth for a full 80 minutes. And they continue to buckle under the pressure. They did it at the national team level. And I assume since we're basically playing an Australian provincial side with the Los Angeles Oz Teenies, that that's going to hold true here as well. You have to be physical and get up in their face and slow them down. Otherwise, they're going to run up 30 on everyone in this league this year. Yeah, it's going to be a shootout. Uh, regardless, you're going to have to out shoot them, I guess. Okay, Austin Gilgronis, Adam Gilchrist, enjoying life right now. We'll get to the standings. Uh, a late try, like 79th minute to beat Nola Gold, 1850 on the road. Roderick Waters scored in the corner on a cross kick from Mac Mason. Uh, Nola Gold captain uh, Kyle, Kyle Bailey might have broken his nose in the game, by the way. Uh, back-to-back wins for the second time in Austin history. It was a good win for the gold. Uh, Roderick Waters is a great player, and he's a great asset on the wing. A physical guy and big, but underrated for how fast he is. And uh, it was really exciting to see that kind of finish to a match. By the way, we should mention um, in the Seattle game, J.P. Smith, typically in the scrum half, playing a winger, he, he uh, got knocked out cold in the game. And there was like a 15-minute delay, as you mentioned, Banksy. And the, here's the Utah Warriors praying. This is a very classy moment from uh, the Utah Warriors. Um, hopefully, JP's okay. I haven't heard a, a follow-up, but he was conscious. He was talking. Uh, but it, it was a scary moment there on, on uh, Saturday. You know, they were uh, contesting the ball on the outside. It was some loose play. And there was some contact with Whippy as they went into touch. And then he fell straight onto the back of his head. And immediately, as soon as his head made contact with that turf, he was out and stiff. There was about a 15, 20-minute stoppage in play. Classy sportsmanship from the Warriors gathering in that circle and uh, and offering up a quick prayer to their opposition there. I was actually in the uh, Seattle locker room after the game for a little bit, catching up with some friends, and he walked back in under his own power with no neck brace to the cheers of his teammates mm. after the match. So vertical, conscious, coherent, and uh, and under his own power there after the game at Zions Bank Stadium to celebrate with his team. So glad to see that he's mostly okay. I yeah. expect him to miss a couple weeks at least, though, with concussion protocols. Yeah, that's great news um, to hear that he walked back in the locker room. That's awesome. Okay, another score. Uh, Houston Sabercats beat San Diego Legion 34-32 at home. Okay, it's one thing just to, just to like, play well after you don't score at all the previous two weeks, which is just gnarly, not even a penalty kick from uh, Sam Windsor. Nothing. Um, but then they scored 34 and beat San Diego. Joe Peterson had a would-be game-time conversion as time expired that missed. And so Houston wins in uh, Nick Boyer's debut at Scrum Half after the trade from L.A. Chris Robshaw of San Diego, and we'll get to this coming up in our preview a little bit, the former English national team captain, uh, shoulder injury separate, uh, dislocated his shoulder, so not anticipated to play this week, and uh, Houston gets the win. It's got to be an upset on just about everybody's pick em. if you had San Diego going into this match. You had to feel pretty good with the weapons that they have and the tools that they have at their disposal. You had to think with Houston not scoring anything over the last two weeks, advantage San Diego, but there is parity in Major League Rugby and a lot of it on any given week, any starting 15 can put it on you. And Houston showing that they're not a team to be taken lightly and uh, getting some things right. A couple of their new additions come in, start making some plays, start making some good decisions. They got some great leadership uh, out, of, uh, out of Boyer, and it was good to see him get that offense clicking for Houston. And that was the game of the next two opponents for Utah. Of course, San Diego this week, Houston, as you mentioned, at home the next week. And the last game was on Sunday. Rooney, Rugby United New York. Beats Rugby ATL. I think that's an upset as well. 27-17 in the snake pit. Uh, Dan Holland's head had 13 points, including a try in the win. That's, I mean, we said a long time ago that this season was going to be decided on the road. I still feel that. I think most teams are going to have a home field advantage. Uh, and you had to believe that Rugby ATL at home had probably a six-point advantage in that game, and it still wasn't enough to overcome Rooney. Oh. Rooney good early and not surprising, one of the top teams in the East uh, to, to snag a playoff spot if it were to happen right now. But we're only a quarter way through the season. There's a lot of rugby left to be played. Rugby lines not out of Vegas, but out of Draper. <laughs> okay, uh, there's still six home games left, uh, and you can still get season tickets, which is awesome. It's a great environment, super fun. 
Um, you can go to warriorsrugby.com and catch that. It's been a, a great time the first couple of games. We're excited to see the fans every time we're out there, and everyone's been awesome, still wearing their masks despite the mandate lifted right, but in that venue, you got to still wear it. So it's it's been fun, and there's still six good home games left. There's a lot of rugby left to be played, and you can get ticket packages at an incredibly bargain price. So Dub Nation, this is your chance to see live sports with people who love the game just like you do. Come on out and see us at Zions Bank Stadium. The next home game is that 24th against uh, Houston as they come to town. So you can make that game part of your season ticket package at warriorsrugby.com. And make sure you catch that game. 7 p.m. kickoff, the 24th. Make the Houston Sabercats as they visit the Warriors. Your first game as a season ticket holder. Okay, let's look at the standings. We'll look at, uh, you know, the, the top 10. There are 12 teams in the league, but L.A. Giltini's only team with perfection right now, 15 points through three games played. The Gilgronis with 12. So Adam Gilchrist, the Australian uh, I, rugby icon uh, now. Top two teams in the league he, as the Gilgronis are tied in second with the Utah Warriors. So the good news is that despite a couple of losses, Banksy, at least a bonus point, so 12 points through four, I think, is a good number. And then uh, Atlanta in fourth, Rooney in fifth, Free Jacks in sixth, and then it's a lot of the teams in the West minus Toronto. Seattle and Toronto tied uh, for 11th, and, uh, well, the Old Glory with six as well. So in a good spot. And when you look at the conference breakdown, which is what it really is, uh, the top two teams go to the playoffs, it's the Giltinis and then it's the Gilgronis and Warriors tied for second. The top two teams go. So it's early. But Utah Warriors, so far, so good um, through four. And you feel like, hey, could be on top of the table as Utah was after last week. But there's a lot of rugby to be played 25% of the way through right now. I think this is what a lot of people expected out of the Eastern Conference. We knew rugby ATL was going to be good. We knew Rooney was going to be a really good discipline team from what we'd seen the previous season. I think the wild, wild west, though, was really where that championship's going to run through. It's been the way through the first couple of seasons with Seattle being there. I don't think anyone expected to see Austin and L.A. at the top of the table the way they were. I don't think anybody else expected Utah to be where we are, and yet yep. here we sit, still in control of our own destiny, tied for second place with the Gilgronis. That game in hand over Austin right now, they're still in second place on points differential over the Warriors, but tied in total points, and uh, really the Warriors just need to start stringing together some serious victories and put some space between them and the Gilgronis to take control of our own destiny as we start looking ahead to the playoffs. Winning matters the most, obviously, but getting bonus points for either four or more tries in a win or losing by seven or fewer matters. Uh, Utah tied for first in bonus points with Austin and San Diego. So getting points every week, uh, that's, that's good. That's good stuff. Okay, games this week. Uh, Seattle at Toronto. Who do you have in that one? I got to pick Toronto over Seattle there. I think the, the struggles that Seattle have continue, even with the win that they had here at the Warriors. I think Toronto is way too disciplined a team to fold under the same kind of pressure uh, that Seattle's going to put on. Free Jacks at Nola Gold. That would um, be a good pick, one. I'm picking Nola Gold at home with that one. I think the Free Jacks will struggle in the heat. Okay, Warriors in San Diego Legion. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, the LA Ostinis against uh, the Houston Sabercats. For as much as it hurts me to pick a team from Australia, i got to pick the L.A. Guilties <laughs> in that one. Okay, Rugby ATL and Austin Gilgronis. Th that's a fun matchup right there. That, you know, two technically top-of-their-bracket teams right there. I'm picking Rugby ATL with too much pace over Austin. And Old Glory against Rooney. I'm picking Rooney by seven over mm. D.C. Okay, okay. Well, our uh, guest today is a member of the Namibian national team. He played in the 2019 World Cup. He's been on the show before, but he scored an amazing try. And so we got to bring him on to talk about it and what a game he had uh, at fullback. Perhaps we'll see him at fly half. We saw him at scrum half a little bit with Fraser Hurst out with the yellow. Let's bring into the program, Dub Nation, for the second time, Cliven Lopeser. What's up, Cliven? How you doing, man? Hi, Jerome. Hi, Banksy. All good. How are you guys? Hey, we're we're pretty good, man. Let's uh let's start with uh, the try, and then we'll we'll go from there. The uh, step and go, the dummy was uh, uh quite the uh, quite the try. MLR's been uh, posting it on social media. What was it? What was that play like in the moment? Oh yes, it was a uh, pretty. Oh, 
So you see it there um, on the move. yeah on the chase there. You're the second man to it. The ruck actually gets cleaned out, so the ball pops up. How big a gap was that that you saw? You didn't have to sneak much through with that dummy. What did you see as you came up with the ball? Because you were really looking to offload and get out wide first. Yeah, um, unusual position. I found myself in close to the rock, but yeah, I just picked the ball up and saw that the first defender was um, left quite a space next to the rock. So yeah, I just took the space and put my head out and went to the try line. Is that an instinctual thing, or did you see something that you were like, okay, now would be a great time for this fake? Um, no, I think it was just instinctively because um, first I, I wasn't as, as much involved in the game as I would have liked. So yeah, so I just thought to myself that I need to get involved more. So I just picked the ball up from the ruck and just, yeah, instincts followed from there. So we saw in the last game, you made an incredible play with your hands and feet and then boot all in one series of events when you took a loose ball, fended one defender and then put a monster clearance kick for Mikey Teo to chase down. And then we see a couple of big breaks from you where you really turned a bit of extra pace there. The more you get the ball in your hands, I feel like the more things go right for this back line. Is there some chemistry starting to develop between you and the boys? Obviously, the more time now that you've been able to spend together. Uh, what's that shaping up to feel like for you in the locker room and on the field? Yeah, definitely. Um, after two games with the boys, I think that they've, they've developed some synergy between the boys. So, um, yeah, I think the, um, with more games coming playing together as, as, um, as a big line, um, it can only get better. And I'm looking forward to it. So 12 points through uh, four games is, uh, you know, tied for second in the league, which is uh, great news. Let's talk about this game specifically with Seattle. Certainly frustrating not to get the win at home, losing 20 to 15. What did, where did you feel like uh, the difference was in the game between winning and losing? Um, yeah. I actually think that we played um, right into Seattle's hands with um, them trying to slow the game down, bring the pace down, and we just played right into their hands um, and um, not stuck to our game plan, which is speeding up the game, um, playing um, with a ball in hand, a ball in play. So, yeah, we just played right into their hands. How impressive was Mika Kruse playing inside of you at center, I guess in front of you, at outside center in this game. That guy, just like you, has a real incredible turn of pace. I feel like that could be a really good pairing for the Warriors going forward this year. Yeah, he definitely brings something different um, with his offloading game, with his face. So yeah, um, us outside in with the wingers and fullbacks can only benefit from them. And yeah, looking forward to with more games with him. We're talking with Cliven Lobster, the Namibian national and fullback for the Utah Warriors. You had uh, 90 uh, meters, uh, a team high in the game. You had five broken tackles. You had four kicks for 166 meters. Uh, how did you feel you played in this game? Um, yeah, like I said, um, first up, I, I wasn't um, actually much involved in, in the game, so it was um, quite frustrating at times. So, yeah, second up, I just felt like um, I need to get more involved and like pop up into places where I don't usually do like to try at the rock. So, um, yeah, like maybe for the next few games, just like um, start how we ended and start how I ended. So, yeah. Do you see maybe a potential switch with you and Hagen? The two of you play really well together. Keeping his boot on the field, I think, is essential. But maybe a switch in positions, if he goes to 15 and you go to 10, that could be a great turn of pace for this back line. I don't, I mean, has that been talked about at all? Um, no, um, not actually, but I, I think we, we, we all good with him at 10 and I'm 15. I'm, I'm enjoying the, um, the space I get from, from the back and he's really, he's a really good guy with, um, controlling the forwards and, um, just like with his voice and everything. So I think for now, yeah, it's, it's, it's so good. We'll plant that seed for you. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, well, it's a bit of a double-edged sword though. I mean, we saw the All Blacks trial this with you know with Bowden Barrett and with um with Richie Monga on the field at the same time and Bowden moving and they can really kind of interplay back and forth and I think we saw a flash of that playmaking ability on your try Cliven where 
you were able to find yourself not in a typical space for a fullback, but in a place to make a difference as, as a playmaker. Yeah, um, I think that's what we're trying to do with the dual playmaking system. So for me to, I'm not only a fullback staying at the back, I'm like, I can take myself and into any position at any time. So yeah, we, we still have a lot of work to do and that with the dual playmaking system and with um, actually two flyers on the field. So yeah, I think it, w it will get better. And uh, yeah, I think we're doing a great job now. So yeah, it, it, it can only get better. You have four games in, lots of, lots of ball to still play. 12 points, tied for second in the league, as we mentioned, through uh, four games. And we're 25% of the way through the season. How do you feel the season's going for this team, and what's the next step? Um, I think with the last two games, um, we've um, lost two really close games that we personally feel that we could have could have won. We definitely could have won. So um, from from here on, it's just like um, taking every every game as it, as it comes. This weekend um, against a very good um, San Diego team. So yeah, just like um, focus on this game and give our best, and hopefully the result will go away this time. So switching gears here a little bit, uh, you showed up here in Utah right before media day, the day before media day, took yeah. all your pictures and did all your media jet lagged. And we really didn't get a chance to see how you were settling into not only Utah, but to America in general. Now you've been here for several weeks. How are you finding it, you know, settling in with the boys and, uh, and with family so far away? How are you finding being here in Utah now? Um. I think Utah is an amazing place. Um, the Warriors is an uh, amazing organization. So I'm settled in, I'm getting along. So everything is great. Um, I mean, I'm enjoying every moment, everything around me. So yeah, I think this is a place I'll be able to stay for a while. So yeah, we'll see. From your yeah. mouth to God's ears, Cliven, we'd love to keep you. Yeah. <laughs> Please stay here for a long time. Uh, who's who's the person that you're taking advice from on like life stuff, not rugby stuff, and on the team that you're like, oh, that's a good recommendation for a restaurant or a book or a movie or whatever. And then who's the person that tells you something and you're like, yeah, I probably don't need it. I didn't need that. <laughs> um, I don't know about who's the person I'm not um, taking advice from, but um, I think uh, a guy like um, I might get to you who's, who's been around the block for. Uh, Sometime now, like just with everything he does, his professionalism in everything he does. So, yeah, I think got, he's a good example. You got a favorite restaurant right now around around town? Um, no, I I don't really um like going out or eating fast food you don't? type of stuff. So, <laughs> but probably sometime I'll go. I yeah, I'll go sometime. You don't get a fullback body by eating out mid-season, right? <laughs> you yeah, don't get... I, I, I try to, like, stick to my the things I know, and that works for me, so... But I'll, I'll have to try some of the American restaurants in the near future, so, yeah. You let me know. I'll take you out to a couple of my favorite places, and we'll start from there. Yeah. So, continuing with our food sure. theme, we had a little banter about this. And I've asked Franco and I've asked Yuri and some of our other South African players about biltong. And it's an African yeah. style of what we would consider beef jerky. And you threw a twist into this saying Namibian biltong is way better than South African biltong, huh? Yeah, I, I actually never heard before a South African said that their biltong is better before, before you told me about what Franco and them said. So... This is the first time for me that I heard a South African say that their bolting is better than ours. So, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just have to get some Namibian bolting and then you have to get some South African bolting and then you just have to decide for yourself. You do that and then we'll get you some Kansas City barbecue and put that up next to some Texas barbecue and, uh, and we'll figure it all out and we'll cross cultures that way, all right? For sure, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about San Diego. So, uh, like you mentioned, this is a team that is typically really, really good. And this year, while they're lower in the table currently, this is one of the most talented teams in the league. What's the conversation like as you head to California to take on a really good Legion squad? Um, yeah, um, we, we know they're a really good team, and but what they bring to the table. So, but. For us, mainly this week and leading up to this game was mainly focus on ourselves because I think in the like in the last 
couple of two weeks, um, our focus shift um, a bit off of ourselves. So this week is all about us. So getting our things right that we think that needs to um, get work on. So yeah, we I, I can say that we're looking forward to this game and like um, hopefully get the win. Just just play well and we are confident that we will then get the win. Love hearing the accountability. Look, congratulations on your first try with the Utah Warriors. Hopefully the first of many more. Cliven, thanks so much for spending some time with us, brother. Thank you. It's a pleasure. That's Cliven Lobster, full back, fly half, a Namibian national team member. Always good to talk to him. So explosive, man. It's going to be fun to see what he can do on this team uh, this season. Um, and, and there's still an opportunity to see this guy in Harriman uh, if, if you want to. If you want to come and see us, the next home match is the 24th as the Houston Sabercats come to town. It's the big week six matchup, the 24th, 7 p.m., Zions Bank Stadium. You can still get tickets. Side-by-side -side seating is approved. We're still encouraging everyone to wear their masks per league regulations. Let's keep each other safe, but let's cheer on our Utah Warriors. Get your tickets now at warriorsrugby.com. Okay, final minutes of the show, San Diego preview. Let's get to it Saturday, 5 Mountain Time, Utah at San Diego Legion. Oh, the national TV coverage. Let's go, baby. CBS Sports Network. And, of course, uh, uh, on the Rugby Network and ESPN 700 960, we will have the radio call of this one. San Diego was in Vegas. They got to go back home, or so we thought. It's it's actually in Carson, California, at the uh, Dignity Health Sports Park. That's the home of the LA Galaxy, of MLS, and uh, San Diego coming off a loss in this one. Eight points in four games, one and three, uh, minus 25-point differential. But don't let that fool you. Seattle ended up beating the Warriors with the fewest points in the league. San Diego is a quality side that we last saw in the 2019, you know, uh, final losing to Seattle. This is a good team still. There's a lot of talent on this team. And with some of the additions like Cecil Africa, the famous sevens player from the blitz box, we saw him team up for a great try for San Diego last week, showing his pace and uh, kicking the grubber through for his fellow South African to finish. There's talent all over this pitch, including former warrior Vita Tamelao. Uh, what's up, Uso? I see you. Um, a guy that can be physically dominant on the rugby pitch. You know, it's going to be a tough matchup, and the Warriors are going to have to be accountable at all 15 positions. So we mentioned it. Chris uh, Robshaw, the former English skipper, hurt his shoulder. So I'm guessing he's not playing in this one, which is a big loss for San Diego. He was on debut last week. That was a big deal around the league, and then unfortunately got hurt. So I don't think we're going to see Chris. He made it through about a half of rugby before dislocating it. I saw on social media he had posted with his arm in a sling that it was dislocated. The trainers were able to pop it back in there at the pitch, and he was having an MRI to determine what kind of damage there is and how long he would be out. I mean, a dislocated shoulder is nothing to scoff at. I imagine he's going to miss at least one week, probably two at the earliest, before he can come back. What's this game going to be like for Mikey Teo, the former San Diego Legion member? Um, because he, here we are, he's playing those old squad. It's not, you know, in the same venue at the University of San Diego in their football stadium, Torero Stadium there. But uh, should should be an interesting one with Mikey and the boys. I think it's going to be better for Mikey. It's more in Mikey's backyard, uh, you know, in Carson there with family and friends that can come watch the game. Uh, if you're Mikey it doesn't phase you at all. The guys played in so many different situations and so many different stadiums. It's just another game of rugby, but deep down inside, you know, quietly in the back of his head, he wants to put it on those boys. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Uh, a couple of players to watch the, including the ones you mentioned, uh, you know, Joe Peterson, the 36 year old fly half. He can still get around, man. He can still get around. You mentioned uh, Cecil Africa. He's amazing. Rising star in the league. Uh, some Wuching, the former Washington linebacker and fullback. And then, Inside center, Santiago uh, Gonzalez Iglesias, the Argentine, he is an interesting player as well. So this, this is a group that, while, yes, they're 1-3, and three, they started 5-0 and oh last year. Yes, they don't have Ma'anonu. They don't have JP Duplessis, who's with NOLA. But it's still a good team. It's going to be a challenge. There are no gimmies in the league. Like, Houston started to look like a gimme when they didn't score for two weeks. Then they beat San Diego. So every game matters. There is a good combination in San Diego of strength and size as well as speed. When you look at their forward pack and you see somebody like Vita Tamilao, but then you see somebody with the mobility at the second row that like a Ben Mitchell does, 
And um, you com combine that with the loose forward play of Saul Wuching, who actually passed up an NFL career to play professional rugby. That's how serious and passionate he is about it. Um, great rugby players. And you add that, the international experience of the Argentine playing it outside center, and they, they could hang 30 points on you pretty quickly. But if it doesn't click for them and it doesn't go the right way, which we've seen in the early part of this season, they can struggle pretty quickly. You know, the Warriors are going to have to start physically dominating very early in this match. I'd love to see the Warriors be able to put some points on the board in the first 20 minutes outside of a penalty kick to make a difference and really put the pressure early on the San Diego team. And that's important because in the first four games this season, Utah hasn't scored a try in the first 20 minutes. So that would be good. That's I, I totally agree on that point. Um, in the final 20 minutes, 42% of the scoring for, comes from Utah. Utah is scoring a ton later in the game, which is great. But I think it, a, a quicker start, I agree with you, would be good. Defensively, tied for second in the league with just one try allowed in the first 20. So typically it's just low scoring start. It'd be nice if Utah kind of jumped out a little bit. And this would be, if Utah wins, the first win against San Diego. A 2018, a seven-point loss, a 2019, an 11-point loss, and a 10-point loss. They didn't play last year. This would be the first win. So they play Saturday, and then June 12th, they'll play in Harriman at home. So this is the first of two at San Diego. It's going to be fun. I love the matchup between Captain Bailey Wilson and uh, and Saul Muching there. Uh, I think a win versus San Diego is an idea whose time has come. There has been never been a better moment for Dub Nation than to go on the road and get a much-needed, fingers crossed, five points from this battle against the Legion. Saturday, 5 o'clock, CBS Sports Network, uh, domestically, internationally, rugby network, and, of course, locally, we will have the call on the radio, ESPN 700 and ESPN 960. Okay, let's talk about a little Rugby 101 here in the final couple of minutes. Penalty kicks or penalty goals are worth three points. We've seen Hagen Schulte blast like a 56-meter uh, kick this year. He is a super weapon with this kick, and it's something that I think Utah needs to access a little bit more. He's got an absolute weapon in his left foot, and we have other guys on the team that may be just as good with the boot. And given the opportunity, I don't think Utah's ever backed away from the chance. We saw, you mentioned, with the big you know, 50-plus-meter kick from Hagen Schulte a couple weeks ago. When a penalty occurs on the field, you can either elect to kick for touch and take the line out, or it's the captain's discretion to kick for posts. It's what would be the equivalent of a field goal in rugby. And it can occur at any point, at any position on the field where you can elect to take that kick. It's worth three points if it goes over the crossbar and between the pipes. And it can be a devastating tool against other teams who are not as disciplined as we've seen our Utah Warriors have the ability to be. So far, it's bit us in the butt, and the opposition has been able to take advantage of that. Uh, a little bit of discipline from our Utah Warriors and the introduction of some of those kicking assets could go a long way. Okay, MLR News and Notes, Player of the Week, uh, as determined by the league, Dan Holland's head of Rooney had one try, 55 meters gained, two penalties, made all of his conversions in Rooney's uh, win against Rugby ATL. And then the Team of the Week, Houston, who upset San Diego, won 100% of the scrums, three tries. So those are some of the news and notes. And, of course, uh, Carson being the home of San Diego. So we could just call them the Carson Legion. I don't think that sounds as good as San Diego, but whatever. Uh, don't forget, we're handing out a bunch of uh, free swag for sharing the show. We've got a signed rugby ball from the Utah Warriors team that's Ooh. going out to one lucky fan. All you got to do is signed. share the show. I believe it is. Yeah, it's a signed that's game awesome. ball that you can get. Share the show on Facebook. Let your friends know about the game of rugby and that we have professional rugby here in the state of Utah. Show your fandom. Retweet the post of the game on Twitter. And uh, let's spread the good gospel of the game we play in heaven. Yes. B yes. Please make it manifest on social media. Okay, that'll do it for us. Like and share this episode of Dub Nation on Facebook and Twitter. Reminder to follow the Utah Warriors on social media throughout the season on KSL Sports, ESPN 960, and 700, of course, as well. For Cliven Lopes, Billy the Producer, and Banksy, I'm Jerem Jordan. Go Warriors!